instructors as a language for open grammar for um, Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank you for having me here and also apologize for the title a little bit because it kind of sounds like I'm going to focus on the infinity structures. I'm really going to focus more on the gram of Witten theory. Uh, infinity structures is a tool which I am going to mention, but the focus is o open gram of Witten theory and I will start with um, standard gram of Witten theory. Uh, I will be to talking only on about uh, genus zero. Um, so the world is a symplectic, is a symplectic manifold, so that's a even dimension manifold with a fancy form on it. Um, and I add to that an almost complex structure. So basically, you can think of any Kähler manifold. Uh, the main example I want you to keep in mind is uh, the complex uh, space CPN. And the question that stands in the core of ground wooden theory is <laughs> ground wooden variance. Uh, we want to count uh, holomorphic maps that satisfy certain constraints. So I'm talking about genus zero, so my domain here is maybe I will, that's a great occasion to use my antenna. Let's see if it's any good. Um, the domain here is a genus zero Riemann surface. Um, holomorphic, well, it has uh, uh, obviously a complex structure. You can also think of it as CP1 if you like. Um, and we want holomorphic maps that satisfy, by various constraints, I mean that you want to count something if you want uh, the, the objects that you count hopefully should be some sort of a zero dimensional space. So in order to do that, you may, you may want to impose constraints on the maps. For example, you want to count only such maps that, let's say, whose image intersects a fixed divisor in the range or something like that. Um, there's a moduli space uh, associated to this problem. And uh, that's a moduli space of maps, holomorphic maps again. On the domain, we fix. Um, Dis distinct uh, points marked on the domain of the map. Um, the equivalence here is just reparameterization. We mod out by reparameterization, and the uh, fancy bar on top is uh, compactification. We want the space to be compact, right? Because we want, eventually, we want to count stuff. So we better work with compact uh, spaces. Um, the compactification, known as the gram of compactification, what ha what the kind of creatures we want to add to what I just said in order to make it compact is, uh, well, when you play around with the domain, what may happen is you move around, uh, say, the points. Uh, some range in the domain might develop faster than the rest of it. And then what happens is what we call a uh, bubbling phenomenon, which results in the limit behavior. It looks like a nodal surface, OK? Uh, so we have two Riemann surfaces with a node, again, genus 0, so everything is spheres. Um, so a typical element in this moduli space may look like a sphere with a bunch of points. So right, this is W1, W2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, may have nodes, may have one node, may have a billion nodes, uh, but always a finite number. That's just a fact of life. Um, these nodes, well, it's a complex. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll mention this later. but. Um, this moduli space, the reason I like it is because it allows me to rephrase a question. It said, instead of talking about counting maps, I can talk about counting elements in this moduli space. That satisfy property. Which property? Those marked points we had before are now required to map into the constraints. So instead of talking about maps whose image intersects something, I'm talking about elements in the moduli space so that the marked points are mapped into those things that I wanted to intersect before. Um, and that's good because this allows me to write an integral. Now, I don't want you to focus on what's in the integral, except that, um, let's say, these gammas are representing the constraints I have in the, in the range. So I have some fancy expression um, that I can integrate over the moduli space. And that is uh, geometrically giving me the answer to the question of how many maps there are in the space that satisfy the constraint. So for those of you who are more familiar with it, these are the, just the evaluation maps at the marked point. So you take uh, a map with, mar with markings and you evaluate at the given marked point. Um, and then, well, OK, of course, you, you, you're supposed to yell at me right now, well, how can I integrate over some crazy, mysterious moduli space? And the answer is, well, I don't, necessar I don't necessarily I am not necessarily able to do that. I don't know how to say it in proper English. Uh, but um, 
But if I can, and in many examples we can, it, ha it has a very nice structure, it has differential forms on it, everything a geometer might wish. Um, I can do this, and in that case, this expression really gives me a number that is invariant in the sense that, for example, if we uh, move around the constraints within homology class, we get the same answer. Okay. Um, so gamma there are the, those are the marked points. I think. Gamma is where I want the marked points to map to. So that these so are the constraints. The um, yeah, or, or a set where the image should lie. So for example, it could be, let's say, a divisor where I want the second mark point to oh, okay, map so to. There's, there's some co-dimension to these. Yeah. Okay. So for example, gamma 1 is some sub-manifold of the range where I want the first marked point to map into. OK. okay. okay. Um, so uh, indeed, whenever possible, it does give uh, re reasonable invariance. Uh, computing them is a different story. Uh, one hands-on way of computing them is using WDVV equations. Um, WDVV equations, well, there's more to them than just computational tools, but they do make an awesome computational tool. And in fact, we have an example from a 1994 paper by Konsevich Manin, where um, they give, they use WDVV equations to produce a recursion formula that allows the computations of all existing uh, invariants for CP2. Um, and these are the sample <coughs> values that they give in that paper. Open Gram of Witten theory it's open, is open in the sense that it's not closed. Our domain, <laughs> uh, our domain used to be a sphere, which is a closed Riemann surface, and now it's going to be an open Riemann surface, still of genus zero, so a disk. Um, we have still a symplectic manifold. We are going to have boundaries, so we need uh, boundary, co boundary conditions. So we pick uh, a Lagrangian submanifold. You've heard about it from Nat last week, but I'll just remind that it's a fancy submanifold of half the dimension that uh, interacts well with omega. Um, and the main example I want you to keep in mind is the real projective space inside the complex projective space with standard structures. Again, we ask the same question. Uh, now I take a hemisphere, a disk, and its boundary, and we map them holomorphically into the space so that the boundary goes all to L. And again, we want to count these creatures, possibly with some constraints. Um, relevant moduli space for that problem, again, looks like a uh, space of uh, maps. Now marked points could be either at the boundary or at the interior. I still want them to be distinct, which I failed to write here because I was saving space. Um, yeah, uh, and again, uh, reparameterization and the compactification takes into account a new kind of phenomena that happens only with disks. Now this uh, unusual, well, the bubbling thing used to, it now has two options. It can happen as before, or it can happen near the, bound, near the boundary, in which case you, have an, you end up in the limit having nodes at the boundary, or if you like, in a real point. Okay, now um, the reason this is very different from before is that, well, one of the reasons is that this kind of node has co-dimension one in the moduli space. It's a real node. It will have real co-dimension one. Whereas before, we had a, a complex node which had complex co-dimension one, so real co-dimension two. So this thing actually adds to the topological boundary of the moduli space. And uh, this, um, yeah. Um, so again, moduli space may have uh, just disks with marked points. So the red ones are boundary marked points, Z1, 2, 3, 4, and Ws at the interior. Again, this may bubble at the interior, at the boundary, maybe both, maybe in many ways. Uh, and again, we can rephrase the problem of counting curves as counting elements of the moduli space whose marked points are mapped to the constraints. The integral we would like to take analogously is the same sort of junk with now we have constraints where the boundary points should go and constraints where the interior points should go. And we write some fancy expression and we want to integrate it over the moduli space. Now the moduli space has a boundary, which means even, even though we change, if we change the, the constraints, even though we may change them still within their cohomology class, the difference will not, uh, will not be trivial because there will be some boundary, some, some error coming from the boundary contribution. 
okay, Stokes theorem, right, tells you that uh, if you take s two things within cohomology, the difference is exact, right, and then an integral of an exact form equals the integral on over the boundary of something. Um, so the majority of previous works, uh, previous methods for dealing with this uh, were trying to somehow cancel out this boundary um, by using all sorts of symmetries. So the earliest one was using uh, S1 action and then um, anti-symplectic involution, so basically Z2 action. Um, the only work that goes above dimension three is here of Penko Dirgieva. Um, also somewhat limited um, within the real symplectic case. And for that case, we also have computations, again, using uh, WDVV sort of equation. Um, they, uh, Georgi Evesinger uh, can compute these invariants too. Um, the approach we used in my thesis with Jake, uh, you will see his name when the results come, so I'm not trying to sweep anybody under the rug here. Um, is entirely different. We, we decided to we, we decided to use infinity structures, which is the thing I promised not to talk much about. So I will just say that um, the bottom line of what it says. No, I, I sort of plan to talk more about them, but then I figured I'll just sound like some algebraic freak. So the, what it really says is the picture. Okay, that's what it really says. Um, if you take uh, maps from the disk and you fix the constraints that you want the marked points to go to, then you have two kinds of co-dimension one contribution. Uh, one comes from bubbling, just as before, and another one comes from when, when the disk slides to the boundary of one of the constraints, see? Next thing you know, it will slide right off. So when the disk slides to the boundary of one of the constraints, you also get to the boundary of the moduli space with the given constraints on the marked points. So this gives us hope because we say, OK, we don't know how to deal with just the bubbling. But maybe if we're clever enough and we can find smart boundary constraints, we can use this kind of boundary to cancel out with that kind of boundary. And this indeed is the case if we use a fancy gadget called bounding chains, which I'm not even going to draw. Um, and we do manage to use this to define some sort of invariance. Um, the, uh, the obstructions now are not, we don't use any group actions. We instead, we try to understand the space of these bounding chains. So uh, that seemed to depend more upon cohomology. For example, the case where L is a rational homology sphere, we have a complete um, classification, and in that case also you can interpret the resulting invariants as if they are counting stuff with um, point constraints at the boundary. So I can't get any constraint on the boundary, I just get point constraints, but I can do this in a dimension as high as I please. I write here x is odd, that's the one that's already on archive. Um, there is, it's probably possible without too much well, it's probably possible to do this for even, but it's still in preparation. So I don't want to promise anything in any, definitely not give deadlines, because I'm not good at this. Um, and computations, yes. So we started with the WDV for computational reasons. Um, uh, we, do, we are able to formulate equations. We are able to make some computations. So specifically for the example of CPN, RPN, uh, we can uh, create uh, recursion formulas from these WDBV equations that compute all possible invariants. The invariants you see here are only those with boundary constraints and no interior constraints, but we can compute those as well. Uh, this is just to give you the flavor of things. Um, well, and to show off. Um, uh, sorry? Yeah, well, that's because we are geometers, so we, saw, we count everything with orientation, obviously. Um, yeah, the, the signs are actually pretty important. Nothing works with, I mean, half my PhD was spent on doing the right signs, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, otherwise they just. Yes, so, so the real way to write it, uh, this Opal WDVV is, 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 well, 
okay, one of the real ways is to write a, P a PD on, on the generating function of the invariance, right, the, the superpotential. Um, it will involve the open superpotential as well as the closed one because, uh, because well, spheres can bubble off of disks. Um, another way of thinking of it is related to something else I wanted to say. Okay, so. so sorry, so when you have that table, it's a complete, it, you just showed us, I mean, it's an identity for all, any number of points, right? You, prove, you, you don't just prove it for K for degree up to 29. N no. Yes, yes, these are just sample numbers. So we just, uh, yeah. You have a formula. We have a formula, we have a Maple program that does uh, the hard work, and uh, yeah. Uh, and we have an ex grad student who does the debugging and the programming. So we have, uh, yeah, we, we have a, we have all number, every number you please. So just name it. Um, yeah, so of course, uh, my main, uh, well, the basic question is, of course, well, I, I assumed sort of some sort of cohomology restrictions um, to understand these bounding chains. Can I do better? Another question is what to do with higher genus, because the whole story was based on the assumption that my problem is with disks bubbling off. But with higher genus, there are other degenerations that um, are not being taken care of by A infinity structures. And the final thing that I wanted to say about WDVV is, is the structure that is associated to WDVV because in the closed case, WDVV is the associativity of a quantum product. And it turns out that apparently it is also the case in our story. It, there is an operator that can be defined that is sort of a quantum product in the relative case, if you please. And um, these WDVVs that we have are indeed, can indeed be interpreted, reinterpreted as associativity of that, um, of that upper operator, I guess. Um, so that is an entirely, uh, that is an additional um, direction of further research and I'll end that, so.